In the last lecture, we looked at the manner in which the British industrial sector underwent something like a revolutionary transformation towards the close of the 18th century. In the 19th century, in the wake of this industrialization of Britain, industrialization emerges as the dominant motif of almost all the economies, almost all around the world, some sooner, some later. But what is curious is that even though industrialization does become the dominant motif, no two economies followed the same trajectory of industrialization. To start with, we look at the country that could have industrialized in the manner in which Britain did as early as the later half of the 18th century, but somehow it failed. Historians of French industrialization have tended to argue that there was a very good possibility till at least the second half of the 18th century that Britain and in France would remain at par and if any industrial transformation had to take place, it would take place almost simultaneously, largely because France was the only country that could compete with the, great, uh, with the British Isles, with the British economy uh, in terms of its market reach. France had a colonial empire that could match Britain. So in America, in Africa, in Asia, wherever the British had a colonial presence, the French had one. What historians have identified, historians like Claude Follen and Marciuski have identified as the real period when Britain began to sort of move way forward and France began to lag behind was the incident of the French Revolution. It is said that the 25 years of revolutionary turmoil in the domestic setting and also uh, France's engagement or in warfare with her European neighbors and then the imperial adventure under Napoleon, the, the period between 1789 to 1815, some people say, simply set the French backward. There are, however, other historians who prefer to le look deeper into uh, this problem. At the time of the revolution, in 1789, France was divided in 36 generalites, which are basically provinces. The potential market of France ultimately therefore remained divided into these fragments because it was very difficult for merchandise to move from one part of France to another without having to pay any transit dues. It simply did not happen. So a product which was probably manufactured in Brittany, in Normandy, if it had to travel south to a place like Marseille, by the time it reached Marseille, on account of the provinces it passes through and the transit duties, the customs duty ends up paying, the, uh, automatically the price of a commodity goes up. So for a product manufactured in, in, in Normandy or Brittany, there was very little market in Marseille because Marseille would also be producing the same product at a much cheaper price without having to pay all the transit dues in between. So all the markets remained localized. What made uh, industrialization difficult in this particular context, if you would compare it with the British case, was that because the size of the market was so constricted, the colonial market being uncertain because it is overseas, anything could go wrong, all these made entrepreneurs fairly unwilling to invest in technological innovations. It was in fact one of the first issues that was addressed by the revolutionary regime when the revolution did take place in 1789. One of the first things that happened that all the inland tariff barriers were removed. In France, as elsewhere in European context, artisanal production was carried out by people who were actually engaged full time in agriculture. Artisan, artisanal production, proto industry was dependent on people who were looking for an alternative occupation at a time when there was no agricultural activity at hand. So, in France, as elsewhere in Europe, it was only during the lean season of agriculture that the artisanal production could take place. And for the merchant to sort of generate any productive synergy in the countryside, he had to wait till the peasant was actually free and willing to participate in 
uh, this uh, activity. In 1789, when the French Revolution began, within the first month, the feudal regime that had constricted so much of French economic potential had been brought down. The downside, however, which was definitely not a downside for the French peasantry, was that when the seigneurial regime broke down, some of the land was redistributed among French peasantry and except for very small, uh, except for a, a section of French peasantry, a large number of French peasantry actually got a, uh, got a share of the redistributed land. The land that was taken away from the nobles was then sold uh, essentially as national property or bien national. And a large section of the French peasantry, generally wealthy or uh, middling farmers, not the marginal farmers, were able to buy land. So, by the 1790s, French um, um, peasantry actually ended becoming more conservative. The French Revolution, in fact, slowed the transition from proto industry to industrialization because the cheap labor factor, which worked in the British case so eminently, was not simply available in case of the French. Because of the in abundance of France's natural resources, especially charcoal, France failed to make the technological leap that British uh, industry made in the second half of the 18th century. In Britain, as we have already discussed, the gradual diminution of charcoal reserves prompted the shift towards coal. In the French case, because of a larger area being under forest cover, the charcoal reserves seemed relatively abundant. Coal, by comparison, was much more expensive. As a consequence, at a time when the British were moving from charcoal to coal by 1770s, in France, charcoal was by far more uh, cheap um, than coal ever was to be. So, at a time when the British really moved, uh, the barriers, the technological barriers to an extent that British, the quality of British pig iron was to improve exponentially within a period of around 20 years using coal powered furnace, France was still playing around with charcoal furnace. So, there were major historical and economic factors which came in the way of France's swift industrialization. Nevertheless, as Gershon Kron points out, that once Britain industrialized, it was very difficult for any other European society to remain completely aloof. In 1815, after Napoleon died, once again France was faced with this very tough choice, how exactly to handle the British competition. And at that stage, two alternatives began to emerge. One was that France could industrialize, could mechanize its industrial production in the same way that the British had done. But this was not possible because first, cheap labor was not available. Second, because capital was not forthcoming, because merchants were not willing to invest in a situation where they could not control the production process because labor was continuing to be within the traditional artisanal mode of production. And of course, finally, because the entire um, organization remaining within the proto-industrial system, such a shift, a technological shift in the direction of, um, in the direction taken by the British economy could not happen. So, France was left with a second option and this was to target a small niche market within the industry, within the textile sector and somehow survive. This the French did. So, first they began to produce for a very small market for the social elite, which were primarily luxury items. So, they would even buy British peace cloth, peace goods and then they would finish the thing. They would give it some unique designs, they would give it some embroidery, 
which would sort of push the price up. And so the French textile sector began to limit itself away from the mass market and limit itself into the uh, small elite consumption market. As a consequence, French textile industry was in never in any position that it could generate the same sort of synergy that the British uh, textile industry had done. In the 1830s, the potential of railway development as a mode of transportation began to appeal to the French monarchy. And the new ruler who comes into uh, power after 1830 revolution, Louis Philippe, had a vision of France which would be united, physically integrated, with all the internal barriers removed. France still remained to be physically integrated because there was not an efficient transport system. Louis Philippe's vision was to develop exactly this using the railways. It was not simply an altruistic motive uh, that uh, drove Louis Philippe in this direction because his principal consideration was being able to move his troops around effectively so that uh, power and authority could be exercised effectively. But while uh, this railway, while this thrust emerged for railway uh, development, heavy industry in France began to pick up. A gentle beginning, therefore, uh, of French industrialization we can see in the 1830s. So iron and steel and other metal industries and most importantly coal proved decisive in transforming France into an industrial e uh, economy. Because it was in heavy industry that for the first time you have industrial organization, factory based production, shifting the locale of production from uh, the artisan's cottage into a workshop with a heavy endowment of industrial machinery. French heavy industry completely transformed its organization in order to survive against British in uh, competition and began to embrace all the technological innovations that were uh, being made in Britain. So what the French did was basically whenever an innovation would take place, they would procure it from the British. They would get a British technician, they would get British machinery and they would then start developing their own industry around it. During 1840 and 70, for instance, the rate of production of iron in France grew by an average rate of 3 to 6 percent per year. Steel production grew by a margin of around 10 percent and other metals by 20 percent. In 1868, two large factories of France alone produced around 40 percent of the total um, iron production uh, um, in the country. The use of modern technology in heavy industry generated a phenomenal demand also in the sector of coal. This in turn prompted the introduction of modern technology in metallurgy and particularly in the mining of coal. In 1789, for instance, France had a demand to meet of coal to the tune of 450,000 tons, of which 230,000 tons, just over 50 percent of France needed, was produced domestically. By 1830, meaning in a matter of 50 years, the demand for coal increased from 4,500 tons, less than half a million ton, to 2.5 million tons, of which 1.5 million used to be raised from the French mines. In 1850, the demand was still higher at 7.2 million tons, of which 4.4 million tons came from French mines. But perhaps the most dramatic surge in production takes place in course of the decade of the 50s. Of the 14 million tons of coal France consumed in 1860, 8.3 million tons were produced in France, meaning the production was doubled in the course of 10 years. By 1880, the respective figures for the total demand for coal and total production stood respectively at 28.8 million tons and 19.3 million tons, meaning France revolutionized its mining and its heavy industry far more effectively than the cotton textile industry ever managed to do. Now, with the growth of heavy industry, use of industrial machinery 
also grew exponentially. While in 1830, France, the French economy saw the use of only 625 machines using around 10,000 horsepower. By 1850, 4,114 machines were running or, uh, uh, with a horsepower capacity of 50,000. By 1862, 17,000 machines with a total capacity of 205,000 uh, horsepower were in operation. By 1875, the figures were up to 32,000 machines with a capacity of 400,000 tons of horsepower. In the course of this transformation, as I have said, it was the railways that played a pivotal role. Now, how uh, pivotal was this? During 1835-44, 34 million francs were invested for railway development to the extent uh, that in 1845, 903 trains served to integrate the French nation physically. 903 trains were running by 1845. By 1852, the total number of trains plying across France rose up to 4,000. During 1845-54, investment rose up to 175 million francs. And during 85 to 64, uh, it rose up to further 487 million francs. Despite all such developments, however, modern industrial system did not really transform the overall character of French economy and society. While heavy industry industrialized, uh, mechanized, most other industrial sectors of France continued to be organized under the traditional mold. One of the principal factors behind this is supposed to be the instinctive suspicion that the ruling Bourbon dynasty had against any big enterprise. All big industrial uh, industrial ventures had to be licensed before it started operation. And this license would be forthcoming only if the government or this dynasty, the reigning dynasty approved of the entrepreneur. If the ruler did not like your face, you are out. During 1815 to 42, for instance, only 342 industrial ventures were given state license. Even in promoting its agenda of railway development, which was a recipe for large corporations to emerge, the French government preferred smaller companies to one large corporation or two or three large corporations. So each area would be allocated to a company who would then develop the railway network and then it would be connected under state direction. There was no integrated railway system in the manner, for instance, it in emerged in Britain. Conservatism of the French monarchy was also responsible for the other real problem in the direction of industrialization. This was dearth of capital. For any mobilization of capital to take place for the purpose of industry, therefore, individual capital could not be relied on very heavily the way it was done in Britain. The alternative was for the state to promote um, uh, in the capitalization or mobilization of capital. From the 1830s, Louis Philippe in some ways tried to move in this direction. However, the private, any private venture of any significance would tend to be uh, shot down. The best example in this case is the attempt by uh, a banker called Lafitte who wanted to mobilize a, cab, uh, a bank or mobilize resources in the form of a bank or financial institution, which would then lend the money for industrial development. Lafitte was denied the, uh, the license to go ahead with this project of an industrial development bank, simply because he was uh, not among the most trustworthy uh, of entrepreneurs in France. Lafayette, nevertheless, uh, and there was a second reason, of course, that the government believed that if Lafitte succeeded, then the official bank, the Bank of France, the Central Bank of France, would uh, simply lose its significance. Lafitte, however, was not to be uh, sort of cowed down by this refusal. He went on in, uh, to organize the first commandite bank called Caisse Générale du Commerce et Industrie 
In course of the financial meltdown of 1848, it was believed that the extent of involvement that Lafitte had made it a great risk for the bank to remain out in the open. So the state simply absorbed it and merged it with the Bank of France, which, in re which basically meant that the state now acquired control over all those um, investments that Lafitte had made. The real surge in France's bid to industrialize actually came towards the close of the 1840s. Many historians believe that one of the principal reasons why this was so was the agricultural meltdown that characterized the European economy around this time. There were repeated agrarian crises in 1829, 31, 37, 1846, and even 1847. In fact, it was this series of agrarian crises that led to the revolution of 1848 out of the social discontent that was generated out of this agrarian crisis. Now, as consecutive harvest failure or economic disaster created something like an economic depression, many small and marginal farmers in the French countryside found that agriculture could not sustain their families anymore. So, there was a large outward migration from the French villages for the first time. And by 1848, you see a veritable flood taking place as these people come into the cities, the civic amenities begin to break down. And the uprising of 1848 follows, in fact, partly because of the dislocation caused by the agrarian crisis and the surge of urban population around this time looking for alternative livelihood. What mattered in this particular case is not the revolutionary setting, but the fact that for the first time since 1770 and British industrialization began, France actually had a supply of cheap labor in its urban locations, which could be used for uh, purpose of providing cheap labor to industry. The most decisive factor, however, for propelling this move towards industrialization, generating the synergies that allowed the French industry to absorb the uh, French, um, you know, the, the, the migratory population into the industrial labor force, happened to be the positive disposition for the first time uh, taken by the French state under Napoleon III. The Napoleonic regime set up three major um, financial institutions that took care of it. The most, uh, the, the earliest of the lot is the organization called Crédit Foncier, which was set up with state patronage. This banking institution was a centralized body which lent up to 10 million francs against land and property mortgages towards basically developing social overhead capital. So bridges, roads, um, ports, all uh, uh, railways, road transport, all of these things were invested in by the state because being expensive ventures, it was unlikely to draw, draw private capital. Credit Foncier made sure that roads were improved upon, railways were better invested in, ports were developed, you know, so the transport infrastructure, the communication infrastructure was being improved upon beyond uh, all measures with money from Crédit Foncier. Similarly, organizations like Crédit Agricole or Comptoir du Agriculture ultimately ended up investing heavily in mechanization of French agricultural production. So, French industry and agriculture for the first time had some substantial amount of capital being made available to it beyond the resources of the immediate producers. And this had uh, beneficial effects as well. But the real breakthrough comes with the institution of the organization called Crédit Mobilier, which was the first example of joint stock banking in European history. This kind of uh, institution, which was pioneered by uh, the family of Pereires, with government patronage transformed the scenario completely. Because Pereires, who are, were a banking family, had a major uh, commercial rival, a banking rival, the family of the Rothschilds. Now, the same Rothschild family in the second half of the 19th century began to lead some of the finest joint stock banking institutions because of the competition posed 
by the Credit Immobilier and the uh, rival Pereira's family. Despite the removal of the final obstacle in the path of French industrialization, the dearth of capital, France, however, never really moved towards an industrial revolution. Industrialization was something that France had, but it was limited into some sectors of the French manufacturing sector. The remaining continued to move along traditional lines. So while use of machines spread, factory organization, the large factories did not really dominate the French landscape. And this, in fact, was one of the things that set the French experience apart from both the British, which we have already had.